Hey guys, how are you doing? Uh, peace and love to you. I survived again. I hope you're well and taking care of yourself and supported in this time of uncertainty and challenge globally. I pray that you are finding your peace and your joy, however you can. And I hope that you are helped and supported wherever you are. It's been a rough 24 hours, matter of fact, it's been a rough number of months. And for me as a black woman, probably a rough number of just years, <laughs> a tricky life. But um, there has been a movement for black liberation. There's been a movement for the uh, rights of our people to be recognized globally, especially in the Americas, but also globally. And we know that there's a history of our ancestors who fought for this from Ghana to the US and South Africa and beyond. The fight for black liberation is nothing new. The fight for equality is nothing new. But as we begin this new phase, I guess, chapter um, of this journey, we are being encouraged to look within our own communities and ask ourselves, where are our shortcomings within our black community? 
where can we do better by each other and by ourselves? And I think a big part of that conversation has to center around investing and building for ourselves, for us, by us. As we cancel people, as we speak the truths that have plagued us, as we work to have our voices be heard, as we amplify the voices that have been repressed and oppressed, it is important for us to be mindful and stay focused in what we want to build. This is a moment of setting a new legacy for reaching for something that is greater, for believing in your dreams and your visions, to think about what you want to see happen, to innovate, to gather, to talk to one another, to uncover all of your discomforts and to sit within the possibilities for your community. This is the time for Black excellence. Let no one deceive you. This is the time for us to thrive, in the, even in the space of scarcity. This is the time when our seed will grow because we are powerful people, because we are innovative people, because we are intelligent people, because we are sacred people, because we are ancient people. And embedded in our DNA is the very solution to our Embedded in our actions of faith are the solutions to our problems. We are the key that we seek. We are the seed. I have many, I've heard many accounts from women, from black women, from trans people, from lesbians, from gay, individuals from the queer community, from the disabled community from so many communities that we consider to be disenfranchised. And I think we all are suffering similar things at the root of it, which is hatred and injustice. And we're all equally human. So the fact that we even have to separate ourselves up into these groups is part of the problem, divide and conquer. But where can we invest in one another? How far can we go to uproot the deeply embedded diseases in our communities? How far are we willing to go to make a lasting change? And part of that, a large part of that, is owning up to our own flaws, owning up to our own mistakes, taking a moment of silence and solitude to really sit with ourselves and ask ourselves, where can I do better? Where could I have supported a Black woman better? Where could I have been a better representation of what I envision for this world? Where can I better share my resources? Where can I better share my platform? Where can I invest? Where can I consume consciously? How can I consume consciously? It is important for us to get to the roots of these issues at this time. Changing faces does not mean a revolution. Changing faces, changing names and and organizations and institutions does not mean that we have uprooted the deeply rooted problem. We need more. We need more. And I know enough brilliant young minds to know that we can achieve more, that we can build new legacies, that we can stand upon this rage and stimulate and provoke life and abundance for our people. That is the purpose of this rage, not just to build, to break down, but to build up. The purpose of this rage is not just to break down, but to build up for ourselves. Because while we're in this moment of rage, other people who are not us are building and benefiting off of our rage. It's time for us to see beyond the now it is time for us to look into the future. It is time for us to imagine what life we want to live 50 years from now and start working towards it now. It's time to tell your children that they're capable of anything that they put their minds to. It's time to give power to the black mind and the black thought. It's time to give intention to the black money, the black currency. It is time to build with intention, organize, mobilize. It's time to build each other up. 
time to learn, to be better, to do better. Myself included, because I have a history of bullshit as well. So I look at myself first. And that's necessary for all of us to look at ourselves first. Because we're part of the solution, we're part of the problem. I have contributed to organizations I wish I'd never contributed to. I sit and I reflect and I take accountability. And I make a commitment to do better moving forward, to be intentional about my partnerships, to be intentional about where my energy goes, to be intentional about everything that I do to make sure that it's going towards where I need it to go, that my energy is being purposed. Black people, you are sacred. Your rage is sacred. Your thoughts are sacred. Your being is sacred. Let no one break you down. Let no one tell you you're not worthwhile. Let no one, let no one tell you you're not worthy. Let no one tell you you're not worthy. Let no one deceive you into seeing yourself as anything other than the winner, and the fighter, and the warrior and the manifester that you are. You have a long history of overcoming. You have a long history of thriving. You have a long history of winning. Lean into that. Your history did not start with slavery. You have a legacy far rich, richer than that. Your history did not start with slavery. You have a legacy far richer than that. And it's time to lean into that. It's time to build. It's time to mobilize and build. It's time to build, Black people. It's time to build. It's time to feed ourselves, to have our own agriculture plans. It's time to grow our own food. It's time to resort to our own medicines. It's time to look in our gardens and look at the ancestral healing techniques that have existed in our bloodlines and in our generations and our communities and in our families for years. It's time to lean into the excellence of who we are as Black people, as Africans. It's time to lean into our ancient technologies, our way of doing things that were considered barbaric and bar backwards. It's time to lean into our way of doing things which was considered barbaric and backwards when we were given civilization, which was a death sentence. It's time to return to the dignity of who we are. For us, by us, there is no other way. We do not want to see Africa, we want to build our own tables. Black people, believe in yourself. Believe in your dreams. Stop seeking validation and affirmation for people, from people who don't care for you. It's time for us to invest in ourselves. In this time, as we resist, let us also build. A lot of us are out of work. We need to build. We need to build for us, by us. I believe in us and I can't wait to see what you build in this time of chaos and uncertainty because you are capable. You were born to do it. Power to you, power to the people, Black Lives Matter. Power to the God with him. Yes. Power to the God within is an invitation to the divine, a space of remembrance, a provocation to awaken the greatness that lies dormant within all of us. A call to offer life to that which has become barren through neglect. This exhibition is an opportunity to reclaim all that has been lost, and to reconnect to a sacred source, no matter your God. Inspired by my own journey of self made healing and an overwhelming desire to live in a world that can overcome its ego long enough to honor a larger divine purpose, I continue to build these infinite portals, knowing that all things are possible when we manifest with intention and disrupt with grace. My name is Georgia Abbott, and you are welcome to power to the God of the world.
Jojo Abbott's work. Um, as a person of color, I feel like my people have been divided into two or separated. Uh, and actually, there's a thousand million categories within every folk group, and we are all one, right? But what I absolutely love is in our future. The future is weird, no matter how you slice it. It's new, it's unpredictable, we don't know what it is. And in it, folks who can't envision themselves outside of our current time just completely inspire me, uh, no matter what background you're from. I don't use the R word, the race word. It, it does not exist, guys. And uh, it is, as Atasha Womak will be talking about shortly, a technology that was invented to create an economic system around selling people. And we are moving out of that. And I'm excited to share that future with you guys. I'm also extremely excited to invite a true expert on the movement that is Afrofuturism, Natasha Womack, who will now speak and join us here uh, and comment a little bit on uh, Jojo Abbott's work as well. So I invite Natasha to come to the group and see um, if you have some input here. 
everyone. How are you? Uh, I hope you're having a, a good week that you're feeling pretty ebullient <laughs> and um, are full of joy. Oh, wow, I can see myself. How about that? Hey. <laughs> uh, but yeah, one, I have to say, I'm extremely you know, honored to be able to share with you and to talk a bit about Afrofuturism. And, uh, you know, Afrofuturism has become quite the term in, in recent years. Uh, and, and some of you may be thinking, well, okay, I've kind of heard this term, you know, what is it exactly? And I like to say that Afrofuturism is a way of looking at the future or alternate realities through a Black cultural lens. And it is an artistic aesthetic it's a, a, an epistemology and that it's a kind of a way of thinking and looking at the world, but it's also a sort of a practice um, to help people engage their imaginations. Um, you know, oftentimes people are socialized to, to feel as if the imagination um, isn't important. And the reality is that so many people have used the imagination as a creative tool to push past different circumstances, to imagine themselves out of a circumstance. Uh, and, you know, many of us are, are always sort of dealing with the, uh, just some of these structures that we're often locked into. And we lean towards the imagination to get another vision. But I think something that's, that's kind of interesting about the way Afrofuturism, the way the imagination functions in Afrofuturism is that people use the imagination almost to the, imagine themselves out of a box to connect deeper with themselves. <laughs> so you're probably thinking, well, you know, what does that mean exactly? You know, how do you use the imagination to connect more with yourself. Well, if you have identities projected upon you, or if you are in circumstances that sort of limit your ability to express yourself, while it's normalized, it may not necessarily reflect who you are. And so these images that people feel they're imagining are, are ultimately things deep within them that they want to express sometimes. And this vision, you know, this idea that you're thinking of something that's in this non-real space really becomes a symbol of, a, of something that's a little more tangible than we like to, to articulate. Uh, Afrofuturism intersects a couple of things. It's an intersection of the imagination, liberation, uh, technology and mysticism uh, and black culture. And when I say black cultures, I'm talking about uh, people in the diaspora, people you know on the continent. And it's that I, I like emphasizing that because sometimes people say, oh well, Afrofuturism, you know, that's an American thing, right? And you're like, well, no, Afrofuturism. Uh, in the way that I discuss it, it very much intersects a lot of the cultures of the diaspora and the continent. And it looks at the diversity within the culture as a complement. And in understanding this complement, that, that's me, in understanding this complement, ultimately we come to see that there's a synergy and this synergy around thinking about the future intersects, again, the imagination, liberation, technology, mysticism, and Black culture. Um, so when you're talking about Afrofuturism, people say, well, am I talking about science fiction? Am I talking about reality? <laughs> Where exactly does this fall? And, you know, again, I go back to this nugget of saying 
Afrofuturism can very much be an artistic aesthetic. Uh, and many of you have seen Afrofuturist works. Obviously, you just saw Jojo Abbott. Um, her work is clearly Afrofuturist. And Black Panther is an example of Afrofuturist work. Some of our funk music fans, if you think about George Clinton and a lot of those album covers, you know, where it's space imagery, um, a lot of the jazz music uh, that came out of the late 60s and 70s uh, was very Afrofuturist, not just in the album cover and the art, but in its orientation and intention. Uh, I think about a, a song uh, by Charles Ehrlin called, I want to leave this planet. <laughs> and it's this very sort of, uh, it's an eerie haunting song in some respects, but it's about someone who has a desire to leave the planet because they feel that the sense of peace and the expression they're looking for, they can't exactly create um, on earth. So, and so they want to leave the planet thinking that maybe they can begin again and create something new there which I think is, is, is very, uh, it's a transformative thing to sort of contemplate. Um, but with that, you know, thinking about it as an artistic aesthetic, um, I, I think it's, it's significant uh, that we, you know, that you see, you know, Afrofuturism as an artistic aesthetic is something that many of us have, are sort of engaged in in one way or another, even if we didn't quite box it in that way. But again, it's an artistic aesthetic, but also a way of looking at the world. And you could say, well, how can something that's an artistic aesthetic also be a way of looking at the world? Well, Afrofuturism is a way of reclaiming. You know, it deals with memory, uh, reclaiming things of traditions, perspectives, thinking on mysticism, or these wisdom centers uh, that came from the, the diaspora and the continent, but it takes that and then it projects it into a future. Uh, for, again, for our jazz fans, if you're a fan of the AACM, a uh, jazz collective based in Chicago, they always say that they do real black music, but they really do a lot of experimental jazz. Uh, and this experimental jazz brings in traditional elements of traditional African in instruments, uh, and, but it also veers and in, in goes into the realm of futurism. And their motto is that we are ancient to the future. <laughs> and, and, and you're thinking, well, how can somebody be ancient and be futuristic? Well, this is one of the core aspects of how Afrofuturism is constructed. And um, I'm going to show you just a, let's see here, if I'm able to kind of share my screen for a sec, because I want to show you all some images here. And I'm opening up this PowerPoint. <laughs> um, Let's see, um, I might have to change that for you. Tom, one sec. One participant can share. Okay, got it. And if it's not ideal, I don't have to, to show it either. Just let me know what's best. No, if you're able to try it, I would love that. Thank you. Okay. You would love it, I think. <laughs> try it now, let's see. Okay, hold on here. Um, Going back to my Zoom meeting. You know, it's so funny with all of these things, you wanna just make sure you're pressing the right thing, right? So Wait, wait, one second. I'm going to open this up. Doo -doo. All right. I wanna make sure you guys are seeing the right thing. Um, and... Where are you? Ah, there you are here. I'm going to share screen. <laughs> and let's see where we are here. Ta da! Oh, wonderful. 
Can you guys see the screen or do you just see me? We see you. We see you. I mean, we see you and your screen. Oh, oh perfect. All right. I did it. <laughs> so um, here's our image. Uh, this is the book cover. Uh, for my book, Afrofuturism, which I, I wrote in 2013, um, very much thinking that I, I wrote this book in part because I realized I grew up with concepts in Afrofuturism. And I had a lot of experiences in college where we talked about, again, mysticism, uh, metaphysics, uh, quantum futurism, we're talking about hip hop lyrics and technology and how you're building for a future and looking at ancient technologies. And clearly there was this moment when I was talking to a friend of mine on campus and I was just like, what is this? And he said, I don't know what he would call this, but it was so familiar to me. And years later, uh, I would be talking to another colleague of mine who told me she was teaching Afrofuturism. And you know, immediately I said, well, what is it? And it was all the things I kind of grew up with. So I knew people who grew up with these concepts, but they didn't necessarily think they could build on it as theory, um, even if they discussed it quite frequently. And if they weren't artists, uh, we're always clear on how to develop it. I mean, what do you do when you're thinking about quantum physics and comics and futurism? How do, you, how do you build on that in your experience? And so in learning about the term Afrofuturism, I was a little frustrated because I said, I've been writing a lot of my professional career. I've not heard this term. And I knew people who felt alienated because they had not heard the term, right? Um, so uh, I wrote this book, Afrofuturism. This image is by John Jennings. And it, it intersects a, a couple of things. Uh, you know, as I mentioned to you, Afrofuturism, it's a way of looking at the future or alternate realities through a Black cultural lens. And you see the different elements that I mentioned as core intersections, imagination, mysticism, technology, liberation, Black cultures. And you see how it functions as an artistic aesthetic. We mentioned Black Panther, of course, and uh, Parliament Funkadelic and Janelle Monae, you know, she's a, a big example, and of course, Jojo Abbott. And, you know, the, but again, this idea of using the imagination to transform your circumstances is just a key aspect of how resilience is a, a critical aspect, not just of the human experience, but of the experience of people of the African continent and diaspora. How does Afrofuturism differ from other forms of future? Um, well, for one, it looks at time as nonlinear and it sees the future past and present very much as one. And if you, you think about Jojo Abbott, for example, you know, you, you saw the visuals that she was, she was working with. Now, there's elements um, in her, her costuming, and let me just say, I think she is fantastic as a, a creative and a designer, but there's elements of her, her style, which you say, oh, wow, you know, this is completely futuristic, right? But then it's all really based on how a lot of patterns and colors um, are utilized um, in, in sort of a traditional sense. You know, particularly the way she layers a lot of colors and fabrics and, and uses them to sort of pull, you know, as these complements. Um, all of that has roots in, in traditional ways of sort of presenting ourselves. And so all that to say, you know, there's an element of looking at anything that's Afrofuturist and it can look, you know, partly like it's futuristic and partly like it's ancient. And think the AACM, said ancient to the future. And that's a constant theme that you see in all works. I mean, even if you think about Black Panther, you know, there's you know, T'Challa, you know, there he's going to the ancestor realm. So there's this idea of pulling from the wisdom of the past, but then there's this very high tech environment, um, which for us is presented as futuristic, but the storyline takes place in the present, right? So you constantly have this engagement in a lot of works 
that we uh, describe as Afrofuturist. Uh, Afrofuturism looks at mysticism and technology as flip sides of the same coin, very intersected. And it, for some of you who might be hardcore science fiction fans, you know that mysticism isn't, um, you know, the mysticism can't be backed up with hard science. It's not really explored. So when you think about a lot of our literary genres or even film genres, you know, it's like science fiction's here and fantasy is here. Um, but in Afrofuturism, they see these elements as, as very much overlapping. Technology, mysticism are not worlds apart. Uh, they're complements. And Afrofuturism also values the divine feminine, meaning that it, it values uh, not just women and femmes, but it values the feminine aspect of humanity. You know, if you think about us as people who are engaging both our conscious minds and our subconscious, the subconscious in a lot of wisdom systems is described as feminine and our conscious nature is described as masculine. Now, all of us have access to these, uh, but that feminine realm is often described as intuitive. Uh, it looks at vulnerability as a strain. It's, it values, Afrofuturism values the realm of the intuitive in the same way that it values our logic and thinking nature. And you, you see this symbolized in art quite frequently. And I think about the Ankh, I think about, uh, and the Ankh is an Egyptian symbol. Um, oh, here it is. You see this balance here. And, you know, oftentimes in, in, in a lot of African art, you also see pairs, you know, this idea there's a masculine image and a feminine image, and uh, they could be a bit androgynous, but there's this idea of pairs uh, is constantly sort of coming up, and these pairs often are a balance of these ideas. Uh, and... Afrofuturism also recognizes that race is a technology and a point that Tracy mentioned earlier. And when she says that race is a technology, you know, ultimately, or race is a creation. Uh, many of us, we forget that the whole idea of being black or white as we know it and the power imbalances associated with it were created to justify the transatlantic slave trade. So when I was in college, I went to Clark Atlanta University, which is a historically black college. And my African-American history teacher, Dr. Mbrusi asked us this question. She said, which came first, racism or slavery? And many of us in the room said, well, racism came first because people were racist and they didn't value human beings. And then that's why, you know, they wanted to enslave individuals. And she said, no, that's not how it worked. Um, actually, there were people who wanted to enslave individuals and to justify it, they created uh, these racist stereotypes and codified it in ways. And they did so um, through law and violence. And we sort of argued with her about this. And the reason we argued with her is because race in our minds was something that always existed. We didn't realize that categorizing people based on color and land mass outside of, and those imbalances was not, well, let me say this. There's the imbalance that was created during the transatlantic slave trade. But prior to that imbalance, people, and, and, that moment, people identified themselves based on tribe or to some extent the evolving nation state. Uh, there was not this idea that because you're on the same continent and you have the same color, that you're necessarily one or one and that you're somehow um, positioned as polar opposite to another group of people. That idea didn't exist. And while we know at this point, uh, we understand that, you know, we're all one and, and human beings are, are, we're all homo sapiens sapiens, there's still sort of this socialized dynamic where people have a hard time reconciling with the fact that race does not exist. 
um, in any form biologically. And Afrofuturism acknowledges that race is a technology and in so doing is a reminder that we, you know, have to interrogate the ideas of technologies and systems. So here I have a, a, a picture from a hip hop battle I attended in Dakar, Senegal. And for me, it was a really synergetic moment. I had a residency in Senegal through Black Rock Senegal, which is helmed by Kande Wiley, who many of you know because he created the, or he painted the portrait of Barack Obama, his official portrait and that, yes, he created this official portrait among many other things. And that experience gave me, provided me with an opportunity to really think about, to think about Afrofuturism um, from a Senegalese perspective, um, to think about it as an African-American person um, being in an African nation uh, and to think about these same ideas that I'm talking about to you, but really, you know, looking at how it was expressed through the culture. And one of the profound moments I had uh, going to the car was really sort of, you know, going to this hip hop battle. And I'm, it, it became this really cyclical transformative uh, experience with time. You know, hip hop, as you know, uh, the break dancing itself evolved out of New York um, and, you know, through black and brown cultures that were in New York, right? So I'm sitting here and I'm watching this battle. Um, and, you know, so there were elements where there was literally like break dancing. And then there were other elements where there was a battle where they're doing dances, reggae dances or dance hall. It was a dance hall battle. And then they're pulling from the culture that's um, out of Jamaica, right? So you have um, this hip hop culture that of course has gone global that was sort of formula formulated by this African descendants in New York. And then I'm looking at, you know, people doing battles in the car uh, from using dances that are from Jamaica, again, evolved from descendants of the African continent. And then there was a moment where people started doing capoeira and it was a capoeira battle. And capoeira, again, is a form of dance that was essentially a martial art hidden as a dance from people of African descent uh, in Brazil, but uh, they, many of them were Angolan. Uh, and we're taking this fighting style there and hiding it in this dance, right? And I'm seeing all of this happening on the continent um, in the city of Dakar, which is, by the way, an amazing place to experience dance and culture. And it's all these streams of dance from different spaces, almost like it was sort of coming home. And then in addition to that, the people began doing traditional dances right, or variation of traditional dances. And all of a sudden, you know, these quote unquote different styles very much look like evolutions of one style all overlapped in one, right? Hip hop, break dancing, uh, dance hall, capoeira, <laughs> uh, and then, you know, the, um, the dances that people are doing to Mbala music, right? And it was incredibly fascinating because dance uh, is a way of interacting uh, or deconstructing time and space. And we don't always think about it in that format, but uh, for me as an expression, that's how dance functions. And I, I was thinking about as a person who grew up as a dancer, I, I think about dance as this way of knowing, right? This way of knowing your body, but also this way of connecting with a larger universe. Here's me um, in the Black Civilizations Museum. Uh, and um, with the, 
you know, a number of pieces. And here's a, a photo to, I took when I was driving through. Uh, and I have to say, if any of you decide to go to Dakar, it's one of the most fashionable cities ever. All the people know what looks good on them because so many people get their clothes made. That's kind of a common practice. But what I was most fascinated by was the color. You know, looking at this, this texture of color and the way so much, you know, a lot of bright colors are overlapped and matched in ways to really highlight the style and the sensibility. So everyone looks good because they know what colors look good on them and they have things designed to fit their, to fit their physiques. And so I'm thinking about sort of this intersection again of, of dance and, and music and art and that symmetry in the culture and the environment. And it was quite groundbreaking. Um, here I'm just showing you a, a few pictures from a Afrofuturist dance therapy course that I have been conducting in the summers with teenage girls here in Chicago. And in the in addition, and, and usually when I'm teaching them dance, and you, you might be thinking, well, what's Afrofuturist dance? Well, I'm using dance as a way to have them think about Afrofuturism. And ultimately, um, what they do is they, they learn meditation, they learn breathing exercises, they learn yoga, but they also learn dances from different parts of the diaspora and the continent. So they're learning rumba, salsa, samba, hip hop. They're learning um, traditional West African dance. We brought in a, a, a dance teacher um, they were introduced to some elements of tap dance, and uh, I even taught them Chicago stepping, you know, this partner style of dancing, and, and we really had them do these dances, and of course, you have to talk about where they come from, and uh, in talking about where they come from, I wanted them to write these essays about how these dances made them feel. And, and to think about these movements and to think about the fact that a lot of these dances are very old. People have been doing them for hundreds of years in one variation or another. Something about that conversation and their trip to the Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago, where they got to see, uh, they're looking at Buddha statues um, and seeing, oh, wow, okay, this person's in lotus position and I'm in lotus position, right? And they're saying, oh, wow, here's Shiva and Shiva's a goddess and wow, you know, I'm doing dance and she was a dancing goddess and, and she's coming out of Indian culture. And, and they're starting to see connections with dance and it's shifting their, their perspectives on time. So while they might not have been very familiar with, say, the culture that Shiva evolved from, they immediately connected with Shiva because she's a dancing goddess, right? Um, or they're immediately connecting with Buddha because he's in lotus position and they do lotus position. Uh, and they're connecting with looking at, you know, ceremonial headpieces um, out of Native American communities uh, because they're thinking about ceremony and the role that dance plays in ceremony. Uh, and to that extent, the symbolism of things that you might wear. And then at another point, you know, they go into a room and they see a, a marching band and it's actually a local marching band. And it's in a, uh, they see it in the form of a short film by a woman named Colleen Smith. And they're watching this and they're, you know, all African-American teenagers. So they're familiar with the marching band aesthetic. Many of them are in marching bands and wanted to be in college marching bands as dancers. And um, at some point, you know, later they said, well, why is this in the museum? You know, it's like, we, we do this every day. We see this all the time. And I said, well, you see it every day and you do it all the time, but many people don't and their first introduction to it might be seeing this video in a museum. And so suddenly they're starting to think of themselves interdimensionally. Um, they even had an opportunity that they see work by Charles White. And Charles White is a, an accomplished artist who sort of came of age, you know, he was a young man in the forties and the fifties. 
And he created many of these works um, that you're, you're gonna look at in the 50s. And, you know, initially when they came in, you know, they're, they're reading his bio and they're like, oh, Charles White, he's from Chicago. And these, they're from Chicago, they're reading a map and they see that, um, you know, Charles White lived in the same neighborhoods they lived in. And at first they were thinking, you know, they're looking at these images and they're really captivated by them. And they're thinking, oh, okay, he's, he must be a guy who's like our age. They didn't realize he was their grandparents' age and that he had passed away, right? So when they saw that, they were, their minds were blown because the pieces they're looking at felt so alive and so contemporary. But more specifically, they saw images of themselves in the Art Institute. So they're looking at Shiva, they're looking at statues of Buddha, and then they're seeing an African-American marching band uh, from their, you know, from the Chicagoland area. They're looking at an artist who was, you know, lived before them, who created things that they are resonating with. And they, they told me later, uh, I asked them, I said, well, when you looked at Charles White's work, what could you what could you tell? And they were like, man, you know, we know these expressions, we know these faces, we know these people. I said, okay, wonderful. I said, well, what else could you tell about them? They said, we could tell he liked, he loved his culture because that's um, all he painted. And I said, well, some of these images that he was painting, I said, um, and there was an image of, of Harriet Tubman. Um, I said, well, you know, all of these pieces that you're looking at in the, the Art Institute, I said, um, who are they painting them for? You know, who is Charles White painting these images for? And they kind of thought about it and they, they're like, well, I guess the people of his time. I said, yes, but was he, the works that you saw where they, you know, he's painting these things in the fifties and sixties, you know, if he's looking at images of painting images of Harriet Tubman, he's not painting something of his time, he's painting his past. And, you know, it was his past in the same way it's your past. I said, and here we are in this museum looking at this work. So who did he paint this for? And it dawned on them that he was painting this for them. <laughs> so we're having this, this shift in time, right? That's a very Afrofuturist way of thinking about things where suddenly, no, they're not just, you know, Joe Blow, a uh, young woman um, in the 21st century learning dance, uh, they are the audience. They are creating and, and doing dances that one are very ancient, but then simultaneously very futuristic. And to what extent are they doing things that are for a future in the same way that Charles White seemed to be, um, where he may have had two audiences simultaneously, the one in real time and the one in the future. And anyway, this is, you know, my very lovely class. Um, they were all super fantastic. And I, I'll leave you with this image. And this is a, a book cover for my book, Eartha 2198. Uh, I have a Rayla 2212 series, which is all about a society in space that emerged from a former Earth society uh, that then went independent. And in this society, they, uh, they took the, the best of, of Earth's practices and principles and, and sought to apply them. And then there were a group of astronauts who tried to teleport and experiment with traveling using their mind. Bertha was one of these astronauts and the uh, attempt to do so went awry. And she wound up on Earth in a time when Earth was people on Earth were no longer going below, beyond the solar system. And so that's where this story takes place. This is uh, the Rayla 2212, Eartha 2198 stories are like my sci-fi epic. But as many of you know, uh, SpaceX launched its shuttle um, and, and went to the International Space Station. And while the story that I'm writing in one sense seems a little fictitious, the reality is that we here on Earth are taking very tangible steps towards creating 
societies in space. And uh, for me, this form of storytelling is very liberating and exciting because I get to think about how, what we would take in the formation of a new world. What do you bring? What are the values that we'd like to build upon in the ideal, in a utopia or a protopia space? What elements uh, of thinking are we building upon? And I, I leave that for all of you to think about, you know, in creating your spaces and your realities when you're thinking about um, the kind of future you want, not just for our world, uh, but for the, the people around you in the immediate sense. Uh, are you being chain locked by your imagination? Uh, are you limiting your imagination, limiting uh, how we could ultimately come to celebrate our humanity and push past a lot of our boundaries. Um, as Jojo Abbott reminded us, and she spoke about us all being one, and, and I speak a great deal about being a champion of humanity. And I use Afrofuturism as one lens to reclaim um, the wisdom systems and the perspectives from the African continent and diaspora. Uh, in, in thinking about them in creating and transforming new future. So thank you. Uh, and I would love to get some of your questions. Thank you so much, Natasha. Let's give it up. Thank you so much for that. I would like to invite uh, folks who are in the physical, <laughs> in the physical audience. If you do have a question, please just raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I'm going to give Tom the mic in about five minutes, and I'm going to push myself in here because I have a very burning question for you, Tasha. That I've been okay, asking. right. And that is, so the first part of our series, uh, Future Conversation, was hosted at the Wanton Lime and Hazard House, which was a, um, a six, I mean, a 1690s built building here in Newport, Rhode Island, and it had enslaved folks residing in it who planted spiritual objects around the chimney, both in the attic space as well as in the basement space. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, in addition to this, they also created in theses or fetishes, as we like to call them. So our first round of this conversation was named Manifest Art. Um, the concept being that if you are creating objects to manifest your spiritual beliefs, your futures, your, your, your liberation, your creative survival through a spiritual practice that involves, um, you know, manifesting into an object, for example, um, has Afrofuturism always existed? And if so, why are we just now starting to use the term? And, um, I think you mentioned the origin um, of its popularity being in the 90s or something along those lines, but obviously, this is an extension of creative survival. It's the ability to look forward a couple of generations and say, we're gonna, we're gonna ace it and, and we'll bring our technology of generational knowledge and wisdom with us. So yeah, so the ideas in at oh go ahead. Oh, that was it. Go ahead. Okay. So the ideas in Afrofuturism are not new. <laughs> they are not new. This idea of thinking uh, multidimensionally is very much a, a foundation of African philosophies, right? Um, going back hundreds, in some cases, thousands of years. They are not new in the least. The term was created in the 90s, um, but even outside of the term, I mean, you know, I mentioned, you know, jazz in the 70s. Um, and there's the figure Sun Ra, of course, who came of age in the 50s. Um, but you can even think about someone like a W.B. Du Bois, who some of you may not know, but also wrote science fiction and fantasy stories. Uh, that's what we're coming to, you know, in the past 20 years or so, those stories have been more celebrated celebrated what they were. And this was in addition to doing his theory, which of course makes all the sense in the world. Of course, W.B. Du Bois, <laughs> a man who was um, looking to completely break down the 
uh, societal barriers of the time, he would be interrogating futures and histories, but he also needed to look to science fiction as a, a way of creatively exploring and thinking as well. Makes all the sense in the world. And you go back, you think about the spirituals. You know, I mean, it's the spirituals and um, that came um, from, that were created by enslaved people uh, where they were very much masking their own spiritual expressions in one in another spiritual expression that they were forced to adopt. They were still looking, um, talking about resilience, you know, the Ezekiel and the wheel story, you know, is, is very much comparable to talking about, you know, uh, spaceships or interdimensional transformation. If you think about uh, this idea of looking to a North Star, um, it, it, that being a sign of, you know, freedom for some people in terms of going North, but also uh, it, it just shows a, it's a reminder that people always had connections to, to space and time, you know, even if people are in really dire circumstances. Um, talking about the Enkisis that you found in uh, the, the building in Rhode Island, you know, here are people looking to sustain themselves with objects that are for protection, but also objects that symbolize interdimensionality. You know, the, the people kind of forget that. They think, oh, these are fetish symbols and, and you know, and I, I can't stand that word. They don't realize, no, these are really affirmations in artistic form um, that in one level serve as protection, but in another level are sort of these bridges through time um, where you're connecting the esoteric and what we call the three-dimensional realms um, and looking to that for wisdom, insight, and protection. So I, I, I'm veering a bit, <laughs> but uh, your question was, where's this term coming from? The term was created in the 90s. The, I think what put it on fast forward though, was that in the 90s you had, the internet was evolving, but you also had cyberpunk culture, you had rap and hip hop, and you had new uses of technology. Uh, and, and people were starting to wrestle what do some of these technologies mean. Clearly by the time we moved into you know, the 21st century, the internet became the basis for connecting so people who were into these ideas around Afrofuturism were starting to be able to connect um, digitally, uh, but they were also able to create works faster than they could before. Um, so you could self-publish your book if a major company was not trying to, was trying to say that, you know, people don't want to read black science fiction. You can self-publish your own comics. And that's exactly what people started doing, you know, in the 90s. Um, you had Tertel and Lee, who started the Black Age in comics. You had a lot of Black Comic Cons in addition to some of the major ones that were evolving. They still continue. You had um, people really interrogating these ideas of these technologies and the possibilities that they could create and writing theory around it. And so I like to credit Alondra Nelson, um, who was a, a student at the time with, and the student in the 90s with creating the first Afrofuturist a digital portal where a lot of people were able to connect and think about these ideas and many of them became theorists or artists. And so what fast tracked is that you started having a lot of theory um, that was being written and getting out to the public. Uh, but literally the, in 2013, um, in the last quarter of the year, the same month that my book came out, which was in October, you also had the Shadow Took Place art exhibit um, that the Studio Museum of Harlem put together. That was an Afrofuturist art exhibit and it was a major success. You had another Afrofuturist anthology um, that came out as well. And you know, it, some of these things and the, the communities that liked Afrofuturism just really started writing about it. And so, you know, the book that I wrote, Afrofuturism, The World of Black Sci-Fi and Fantasy Culture, became a good primer for many people, you know, who were thinking these thoughts. And then, you know, they go and they read the book and they're able to see other references. So the book helped in terms of, the book was a big connector 
but it was also part of this synergetic movement where more people were starting to do Afrofuturist art shows. And this is, again, starting around 2013-ish. Awesome. Thank you so much for your incredible wealth of knowledge. I love this conversation. I'm going to um, pass the mic to Tom Karate. I know he has a question or two, having uh, recently read one of your pieces. Go ahead, Tom. I'm, uh, oh, hi, folks. Thank you so much for this, Tracy. And what a pleasure listening to your little presentation there, Yatasha. Just wonderful. Thank you. So inspiring. I, at the moment, don't so much have a question as I want to pay my tribute and thank you. I, I want to just tell you, it's just a, in capsule form, something about a program that Common Fence Music runs and how you are helping toward the future here. We have a program called Connecting the Beats, bringing African-inspired drumming and dance to the youth of Newport County. And connecting the beats means a number of things, connecting cultures, connecting neighbors, connecting rhythms, and quite specifically in the beginning, it was to connect the, the hip hop and rap cultures, the computer beats makers, to some traditional African rhythms. And that hasn't fully manifest itself at this point, but it's a road forward. But you, um, in this synthesis, I just see it as a synthesis of ideas, Afrofuturism, and a very, very useful and inspirational label. Very helpful to me in terms of seeing the path of this program, Connecting the Beats, moving forward. And, and for that, I have to thank you so much. I have specific questions from your bibliography and discography, but I did pick up the book. I haven't, I've only be, just begun it um, uh, seven years later, but uh, I, I do have specific questions with, which I believe will be answered in the text. So. Thank you, this is very exciting. Of course, I grew up with Sun Ra. I'm a fan of hard bop and bebop, and I re respect him as a cosmic ambassador, but I couldn't listen to a whole lot of the music, but it's fabulous that he's getting his tributes through this, um, this movement at the moment. Again, I, I, I won't take any more of your time, but thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. No, and thank you. And, and Tom, I also wanna look into uh, a DJ and producer named King Britt. He teaches a class called uh, Black Black Tronica or Black Electronica. Well, Black Tronica, but it's a a, a Black Electronic uh, class that he teaches in uh, one of the universities in California. I want to say, let me not say which one it is. I'll give you the wrong one. Um, but I think that it might be interesting um, to see some of the work that he's done because one of the Brits, you know, it's, it's all history around Black innovators utilizing beat technology, uh, really from the forerunners and in, in utilizing it uh, to articulate music of the future and doing so through hip hop, but also through house music. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a Chicagoan, so um, it's just something to kind of think about all the early electronic music and jazz. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll see well, in, you know, a lot of um, looking at those drum patterns, um, thinking about house music in South Africa um, or house music in Chicago, particularly a lot of juke music, um, and there's a relationship between a lot of the, the patterns there, which, you know, if you want, depending on how philosophical you want to get, I think might be kind of fun. I'm not going to be able to keep up with you, but I'm just uh, fascinated <laughs> you know, by your breadth of knowledge. Thank you so much. No, thank you. I'm uh, putting King Brit's name here in the chat. King Brit. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. We invite um, other folks on the Zoom network here to uh, post their questions. Um, I'm, I'm ecstatic at this. I wanted to ask you a question, Tasha, while, uh, while the rest of you guys get yours ready. And please, if you do have one, just interrupt me at any time. Um, there is a, a, a dude on your shoulder that, that peeks through whenever you lean over one way or another. It looks like maybe Oh, no, you can see him. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> oh. First off, who is that? And then second, it actually reminded me of a question that I had because you told this wonderful story in one of your talks about speaking to um, young, uh, young people um, about Afrofuturism and how you got them to a place after 40 minutes of uh, introducing the topic which is a great story, and I, I would ask you to retell it, 
um, if you want to, but also it's available online for wonderful story. But it actually brings the question what POC folks would bring into the future, what narratives. And I wonder, because this word colonizing planets keeps coming up over and over in sci-fi and it's kind of like an overarching concept that we would go somewhere and colonize. And I wonder, is that even, you know, is that, I don't feel like that's part of what I would do if I was going out into space, if that makes sense. Uh, and that word does not apply to my philosophy at all. And so how do you relate to that word and how do you think it fits in, if at all? Uh, just... It's problematic. <laughs> and I was actually a part of a decolonizing Mars symposium uh, that was held at the Smithsonian. Um, which was a really amazing experience. And, you know, the reason we're calling it decolonizing Mars is specifically because we become so accustomed to using the word colonize when we talk about going into space. And, and that history is a, a difficult, ugly, tough, and violent one. Um, and so while, you know, we're very much in a time where we're using the term decolonizing, you know, because we want to decolonize our thought processes and our systems. Uh, but in going to a realm like space, we want to change our terminology, which is why when I was talking about the Rayla 2212 series and Eartha 2198, I said the word space societies and, and, and not, you know, colonize or settlements. And um, because these, again, are, are words that have histories that I don't want to say they imply a certain approach to, to looking at space, but they are action verbs <laughs> that tell you how people are looking at interacting with space. And, you know, I think it's really important, you know, as we're making these, these great strides to think about not just language, but uh, philosophically, what are we really doing? And, you know, what exactly do we want to bring into these new spaces? And, you know, I, I've, you know, because there's all kinds of talks about, oh, we're going to go and, and, you know, find asteroids and we're going to mine the asteroids. And you're like, well, you know, and the, or, oh, we're going to go and if we can get to Mars or we can create our own space society, uh, we are going to, you know, abide by our own rules. And you're like, well, whoa, well, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> Right? Uh, because there is space law, and not that many of us are familiar with it, but all of these things will become really nuanced conversations, um, particularly because, you know, so much of the push into space is a, a government and, and the, the, it's a partnership with government and um, private companies, which, you know, isn't a bad thing, you know, it's, it's it could be a very great and wonderful thing. But we want to, when we talk about democratizing the future, we also want to democratize space because space is for everyone. And uh, everyone should have access to being able to engage with, with the societies, regardless of whether you're an engineer or you're a billionaire. Um, all of us have a contribution to make to societies and to the effort to get there. All right, Roz has a question. Go ahead. I'm taking it, Tasha. You're muted, Roz. <laughs> Classic. I'm muted. Um, hi. Uh, thank you so much for taking my question. What a fabulous presentation. Um, Tracy, thank you so much too. Um, I, I work with youth in Providence and I'm also someone who's been really into sci-fi and um, uh, pretty much everything that you were talking about forever. <laughs> um, so I just feel like it just was, uh, it was yeah, just so fabulous to hear your presentation and be like, yes, 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 yes. Um, but so I was trying to think back to like when I first got into some of these concepts and I'm and I'm wondering if you have any ideas for how to connect youth to these types of things as well um, like a sort of like an intro to Afrofuturism um, like a place to start because uh, there's so many vast I mean there's it's, it's just such a vast um, there's just, just so much so um, yeah I I would love to be able to introduce more of the youth that I work with um, to these things. 
Sure. Well, one thing that I found to be really interesting, um, you know, I, I like using art as a vehicle, but just to have them write a story about something that would take place, you know, in 100 years, in 200 years, in 500 years, in 50 years. And just kind of starting there gets interesting. You know, Tracy earlier asked if I would recount a story, you know, of working with a, a group of fifth graders. And <laughs> one of the fascinating things, you know, I was asked to come in and, you know, speak to a, a class. And my immediate thought was, oh, these are kids. Their imaginations are wild. They're all ripe and ready to talk about the future. And, you know, initially when I started, you know, just talking to them about the future, like, oh, you know, um, what would you like to see in the future? And they would say, oh, we want a world with no violence. Okay, it's wonderful. And then, oh, what would you like to see? Oh, we'd like a world where, um, yeah, there's no violence. They're like, oh, great. I and mean, what about you? You know, oh, we kind of like a world where, yeah, there's no violence. And, you know, it can, and, you know I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Um, what's going on here, right? And, you know, it's, it, and, you know, you kind of, I'm expecting here about, you know, electric cars and, you know, the flying car. And, and they were so into this element of violence. And I said, okay, great. Well, that's a good thing not to want. Uh, what does it look like when you have a world without violence, right? What does that look like? And they're like, mm, well, we could play outside. Okay, wonderful. What, what else could you do? Um, let's see, you know, and, then, and slowly they start, they're like, oh, we would treat one another nicely. It's like, okay, what else would you do in a world without violence? Oh, well, we wouldn't, you know, and so it was really this methodical like breakdown of, okay, I get what you don't want, right? But even in your toughest moments, um, there's moments where it, everything's not violent, right? Uh, all aspects of your life don't reflect that. So let's think about those things, you know, those moments that aren't like that. And, and how can we flesh that out, right? Uh, without me actually saying that. And literally, you know, they start talking about the things they would do in a world where there's no violence and how they would treat people and how they would act. And, and you know, once we got past that, which took a good half hour, you know, then they were able, I was able to say, okay. Then I said, well, you know, in Afrofuturism, I started explaining different things. I, I used music. The thing that really got them, you know, once their minds were open to this future with no violence, the thing that really got them is when I talked about um, a, a theorist named Coldwell Ushun, who talked about um, electronic music and, and Black creators and electronic music, and he used the term alien music, you know, because his theory was that it wasn't based on the past, and a lot of Black music is always contextualized as being related to the past. His theory was that it was a completely new thing, and he's talking about trip hop and and you know, hip hop and house, et cetera. And so he called it alien music. And I was just kind of, you know, saying that point to get to something else. And then one of the girls raised her hand and she said, well, what's alien music? I said, oh, well, you know, you know, trying to describe what he was saying. And then she said, well, I want to create alien music. I said, oh boy. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm not a, a beat maker, right? So. I said, yeah, well, you know, and I started talking about Chicago electronic music. And then one kid asked me, it, it was really mind blowing because they're fifth graders, you know, and they're on the west side of Chicago. And one kid said, well, is blues futuristic Afrofuturism? I said, well, I said, it's interesting. You said that. I said, because blues is the basis for the future of music, right? It's the basis for modern and postmodern music which he got right away. And, you know, Chicago, you hear the blues a lot. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that, well, my guess was he probably heard it from his parents or grandparents or something kind of around. It might not have been his music, but he certainly heard it. Later, 
I talked to Billy Branch, who's a, a popular harmonica player. He's an iconic harmonica player out of Chicago, he played with all the blues legends. He's a legend himself, uh, but he's on the younger end, right? He kind of came of age, late 70s, early 80s. And I told him this story about this kid asking me, was blues music, you know, Afrofuturism, was it futuristic? And he was like, you've got to be kidding me. You know, because he came up in a time where people were acting like blues was this old time music. And he said, I've done so many workshops all over the city with kids about blues. I said, well, it had an impact because this kid saw blues as the future. But it's a future in a lot of ways, right? Because it's the future in that it's the foundation of modern music. Um, it's, it's ancient in that it's kind of based on a lot of Malian blues um, out of the, the African country of Mali. Uh, and it's usually not contextualized that way. If you ever get to hear Molly and blues, please do. Um, but then, you know, at the same time, you know, you, you think about the messages in blues, which is really some people holding on to a form of resilience um, to kind of move through, which is very sort of moving to the future idea, which is hip hop all day long, right? <laughs> And so, but this kid is literally thinking about these chords and these scratches and the blue note, right? Or, you know, these in-between chords, which again are very African. And he's seeing that as futuristic. And if you think about like space sounds and you think about electric blues, it's very parallel. There's a lot of interconnectivity in terms of the actual harmonies, or I don't want to call them harmonies, the sounds you're hearing. And so that was sort of mind blowing because he's seeing that connection, right? And so while I'm peeling back these layers, you know, and, and I'm like, oh my God, it took 30 minutes. I'm thinking they're gonna immediately talk about the car, the flying car. It didn't take them long. Once they were there, oh, they shifted, you know, where they're completely seeing these intersections. And I've not had an experience where kids and teenagers, once you get them in a space, they see the intersections immediately. Um, you don't always have to spell it out. They might not know, obviously, the philosophical context, right? But they get it and they'll go there. So for me, that turnkey moment is one, sort of pushing the past certain ideas. Music was a big turnkey, right? Thinking about futures is a big turnkey. Art is a big turnkey. Um, so to the, uh, you know, and, and just sort of, or um, images, uh, you know, earlier when they were talking about the Nkisi, you know, thinking about these objects and starting to talk about objects uh, in interdimensional ways, I found to be really interesting for students. I hope that was helpful. That was so helpful. Um, I, I teach piano, so I'm a piano instructor. So I really appreciate you talking about really the basis of what we consider to be American music, you know, because I teach a lot of blues, actually. I teach a lot of jazz. Um, and then um, actually, well, so thank you for that wonderful response, uh, thoughtful response. So interesting. Um, but I'm also wondering, do you make playlists? Because I feel like you make some killer playlists and I'd love to follow you wherever I can do that. <laughs> Yes, um, I am so proud of my playlist. <laughs> I actually co-created a playlist with Janelle Monet. Um, so she has a Black to the Future playlist, which if you look at her on Spotify, it's on there somewhere. Um, and you probably will totally like that list. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, Natasha. Uh, so you, um, you went out a little bit um, on our end here when we were talking about your playlist. If you don't mind just putting it in the chat. Oh. You also enjoy that. <laughs> yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Spotify. Yeah. So Janelle Monet, um, the kind of iconic Afrofuturist creator, uh, I co-created a playlist with her that's um, called Black to the Future. And we have music by Sun Ra and Shabazz Palaces. It's a hip hop group. And, and of course, Janelle, Erica Badu, many others. And uh, they, it's 
all under uh, Janelle's name. So you can find, you know, the Black to the Future playlist. I create playlists all the time. I have a million themes. Um, so uh, the, uh, so Raz, uh, you can just email me if you want to. If you're a Spotify person, I can forward some other stuff. Oh my God, I would love that. I would be so honored. Yeah, sure. I'll just send you my email here. And my email for everyone else, if you guys have questions, it's um, ysoulstar, Y-S-O-L-S-T-A-R at gmail.com. Or you can just go to my website, natashawomek.com. Thank you, Natasha. That is extremely generous of you. And thank you so much for visiting the smallest state in the union and sharing your love and knowledge with us. And I, I'm beyond grateful for your presence here. And I know you've literally affected at least two nonprofit um, folks who work closely with BIPOC people in the state and who are really interested in bringing um, this really empowering concept to them that they are probably already the kids know about but don't have the name for yet. Um, did you have any question here? I saw you look at me, Dominique. Did you want to say anything? Okay. Well, we're going to conclude our night, and I want to thank you so much for being here. Yeah, let's give a touch of round of applause. Thank you so much. Yeah, and can I just say, you know, thank you to all of you um, for your interest in, in, in your work in creating futures that value humanity and for your excitement and your interest in Afrofuturism and for all of the work you're doing uh, to like support and advocate for the arts and really just, you know, highlight how we're all interconnected. I, I deeply appreciate it. And um, yeah, I just want you to know, I deeply appreciate it. And, and you, you're having a, a big impact and just thank you for that. Your works reverberate into the future and beyond in ways uh, that we can't always uh, assess formally, but um, it, it's, it's phenomenal. Thank you, as do yours. We're gonna close off the night, but I'm gonna actually just go onto Jai's Instagram page, Omega Art. Um, that would be our local rep here, <laughs> our local young artist. And we'll leave that up as a, as a page here for closing it out. But again, Natasha, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you to everyone who joined us on Zoom. And then finally, thank you guys, the live audience here with me. And uh, this was sponsored by Common Tuesday and the Rhode Island Council for the Humanity. So we appreciate the community. Thank you, Natasha. I hope to speak to you soon again. We'll see you in the small state. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Let's see here. How do I do this? Do you mind, Jai, if I share your page? If it ever works. This on. Thanks, everybody. We'll catch you next time, and we'll just start putting stuff away here. But Natasha, I'll catch you soon. Yes. Ross, thank you for your questions. Bye. Bye. Tom, thank you for chiming in. You guys all soon. Bye now. Thank you guys for coming.
Thank you. 